special day, uh, one of the first Sundays typically of every year. Uh, we have what we call Vision Sunday, and it is a day where we unveil our theme for this year. So for the calendar year of 2023, you can see right behind me, we have these banners here, and our theme this year is Making Every Member a Minister. Making Every Member a Minister. Now, you, some of you may be looking and say, Preacher, I couldn't see the word every, and I couldn't see the word a. I'm letting you know it's there. All right? It's hard to make something that everybody can see and try to put some color to it and at least give it some pizzazz. But um, some of you are probably going to come up to me and say, I couldn't read that from the back row. I understand. But that's why we placed it right on here for you. And uh, you can all see it right here. And, uh, but that's our theme for this year, Vision Sunday, Making Every Member a Minister. Now, ultimately, what I'm going to be sharing with you today is, you say, well, pre preacher, I'm not a member. Well, you can fix that. You say, preacher, I'm a member, but I haven't really been serving. You can fix that. That's what this whole year is about, is for you and I who are born again to yield ourselves to the Holy Spirit and be used for the sake of His kingdom. You know, it thrills my soul, every one of these Samaritan's Purse workers that are here and that are devoting their time, you know what they're doing? They're giving of their life to the Lord for the service of His kingdom. And we have a job here. It is, that job has been heightened. Uh, the end of September with that storm that came through, this job of reaching people with the gospel has been brought much more into focus. And may the Lord help us this year to really follow Him and His leading. I'd like to use as my text here today the first 12 verses of chapter number 4 of the book of Ephesians. Tonight, when we meet over in the gymnasium, I'll explain a little bit more after the message is over, I'm going to go ahead and share with you from verses 11 through Verse 16, we're going to talk a little bit further about what that means. But today, let's just emphasize these first 12 verses. Let me begin reading in verse number 1. The Bible says, I therefore, Paul's writing here under the inspiration of the Spirit, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body, one Spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles, and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. The title of the message it follows right along with our theme this year, Every Member a Minister. Let's pray together. Lord, I ask today that you would help us, guide us in these few moments. May we be still before thee, not let anything else detract us from paying attention to what you have. And I, Lord, ask for your guidance and supervision upon my lips. May I speak only that which you'd have me to say. May I stand behind the cross. May Jesus truly be seen by these people. And I ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. I'm going to give you a word, and I want you to think about this word for just a moment. It's the word purpose. Everything in this life really should have a purpose. I read a story some time ago about uh, 
a Scotchman who had, was demonstrating the new game of golf to President Ulysses Grant. This was back in the 1800s. That Scotchman placed the ball right on the tee, and he took a mighty swing, but his club hit the dirt, and dirt splattered all over the beard of Ulysses Grant, went all over the place, and that ball sat there right on that tee. The man swung again, and again he missed. Six times he swung, and that ball sat right on that tee. And Ulysses Grant said, There seems to be a fair amount of exercise in the game, but I failed to see the purpose of the ball. <laughs> you know, everything in this life has a purpose. I'm going to throw a few pictures up on the screen for just a moment, simple pictures. Please don't blurt it out loud, but just to yourself... Think with me what the purpose of these things are. What is the purpose of an automobile? What is the purpose of a hammer? What is the purpose of a microwave? What is the purpose of a human being? But more importantly, as we sit in church here this morning, what is the purpose of a born-again Christian? If you're here today and you know Jesus as your Savior, you must ask yourself, what is my purpose? Far too many Christians have lived their Christian life aimlessly, but God saved you and he saved you for a purpose. I'm going to give you the main point of the sermon in a sentence, and I want this to go up right on the screen right now. I want you to notice this here. God has saved you in order that you might find your gift and express it through the local church. Let me read it one more time. God has saved you in order that you might find your gift and express it through the local church. Now, I want to take that and I want you to read it with me, but I want to substitute the pronouns Instead of the you, I want, I want you to put a personal pronoun here. So I want you to say this with me. God has saved me in order that I might find my gift and express it through the local church. Ready? Oh, come on now. I'm, getting, I'm looking for feedback here, all right? You ready? All right, here we go. God has saved me in order that I might find my gift and express it through the local church. All right, that was good. Let's try that one more time because I wanted you to get this in your mind. Ready? God has saved me in order that I might find my gift and express it through the local church. Well, in this sermon here for the next few moments, I'm going to go ahead and explore this proposition and see how it flows through our text today. First of all, I want you to notice in verses 1 through 6, the calling of that ministry that we're to have. Verses 1 through 6, the calling of this ministry. Now, we come to verse number 1, and we see a very familiar word that is easy for us to pass over. It is the word, therefore. Paul says, I, therefore. I remember hearing a preacher many years ago said that when you see the word, therefore, you need to find out what it is, therefore. And so what is the word, therefore, therefore? Well, that word is connecting the first three chapters of Ephesians with the next three chapters of what's going to happen. In every one of Paul's epistles that he writes, he usually begins with giving doctrinal information, and then he follows up by giving practical application. In other words, Paul encourages us what we ought to believe, and then he exhorts us how to behave. Our behavior is linked to our belief. So in the first three chapters, what does Paul tell us here in Ephesians? We're not going to thumb through it, but I'm just going to throw out a couple of these statements. You and I who are saved have been chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world to be blameless in his sight. God's wrath was upon us, but we've been made alive by Christ and redeemed by his blood. 
And each of us who are saved have the Holy Spirit as a guarantee of that redemption. Now, chapters 1 through 3 explore those three truths and many other things. But then Paul says, look, I want you to understand something. I've taught you these things in chapter 1 and 2 and 3, but now I want you to know how you ought to live. And that living is affected by our calling. So how is this linked here, the behavior and the calling? Well, let me give you three thoughts from these six verses here. First of all, there's an assessment that has to be made. Look again at verse number one. I pointed out the word therefore, but there's two other words I want you to see. It is the words worthy and it is the word called. You and I, first of all, have been called by God if you're saved today. You know what God has done? He's called you. He saved you. He's rescued you from your sin and the penalty that was associated with that. And God has brought you to himself. But now notice a word that must be put together with this word calling. It is the word worthy. The word translated worthy comes from the Greek word axios. It is a word which is used of the axis on a scale, that is, a scale that was used to purchase items, and the currency was laid out on the balance there. Do you realize that our walk is to balance out with our talk? Our practice is to line up with our profession. Our life is to square with our lips. But God goes even further than that. God has done so much in saving us that he looks for an investment on his return. You see, far too many Christians say to themselves, well, preacher, look, I'm saved. Someday I'm going to heaven, and I just kind of, you know, kind of live a little bit here and do a little bit there. No, 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 no. If God just saved you to go to heaven, the moment you said amen at the sinner's prayer, you would have been gone. But God left you here for a reason. He's looking for a return on his investment. And God here, out of his mercy and his grace, has saved you and has given you all the resources that you need to live for him that is worthy of the calling that he's given to you. Now that's the assessment you got to have today. Before you ever consider being a servant or a minister in this local church, you have to come to this. God's called me. He's looking for a return on his investment. That's the assessment. Let me give you a second word to think about. It is the word attitude. I'm just going to briefly look through this. Look at verses 2 and 3. Here's the attitude you ought to have as a Christian. Lowliness. What is this? It's humility. Oh, how much we need humility in Christian circles. We get a lot of pride out in the world. We have a lot of pride out in the Christian world as well. But how much we need humility. Meekness. This is strength under control. All of us have had things that have kind of rocked our world. And what we need is meekness to deal with those things. He speaks of long-suffering. That's patience. How many are learning patience today? Oh, I learn patience every day. Going through our rebuild project, you can ask our trustees and our deacons, I'm having to restrain myself. Because I don't have enough patience to go to wait on people and things and stuff that are going on. I want stuff done right now. And boy, God's teaching me patience. But then he talks about forbearing one another in love. You know how beautiful this church would be if every person would forgive one another and love one another? You know, the beauty of this church, the, 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 the aura, the, the, the great uh, sweet-smelling savor of this church, if every person would have these attitudes. But these attitudes are linked together with verse number three, a unity. Now, you know, it's amazing. I look right across this auditorium right now, and I see a lot of different people. I see people from a lot of different states, different countries, 
I see people that have been in different backgrounds in their world. Some are, are, have worked with their hands. Some have worked in an office. Some have this background of a, of a, of a, a great family raising. Some, their families were split apart. But I want to tell you something. Though there is a diversity in this group, you know what there has to be in the church? A unity that is based on the fact we've been saved and we have the Bible to guide guide us. And so there's this attitude here that is shown. But let me give you the third word, and it's in verses 5 through 6. It's this affiliation. You see, it's imperative for you and I to understand some things that are crucial about us as a Christian. Christianity is not a solo event. Christianity is not a lone pursuit. You and I are called together to live deeply with one another, and he begins talking about everything that has to do with something of one. There's one Lord, one faith, one spirit, and one body. Now, I know there's some grander things here that can be spoken about in a very general sense, but I want to bring it down right here. What God knows and understands and what the Bible is very clear about is the one body is the body that you can come and fellowship with others. You might say, well, preacher, you know, there's people saved all over the world. Right. But how do you forgive those other people in China that you'll never meet? How do you love those people in India that you'll never, ever see? God is coming to this local body where you join, where you put in all your marbles, where you share together, and it is this one body. You know what God's done? He's called you today. If you're saved, he's called you out of the world, but he's called you to something. Some of you that are here today and are flirting around with joining, some of you college-level kids that haven't yet stepped forward, I want to encourage you something today. Step forward and give your life to God through the local church. Some of you that are here today need to understand the value and the importance of the church because God gave his life for the church. So he's called you by saving you out of the world, but he's called you here. But now notice verses 7 through 10. I want you to see something else here, and that is the cost of this ministry. So the calling. God's called me, but now there's a cost. The very interesting words that are given here, beginning in verse number 7, and I'm going to highlight one word that's going to kind of carry through this point here. It is the word grace. Grace. How many of you are saved today? Would you give me an amen? amen? You were saved by the grace of God. What's grace? Grace is God giving you something you don't deserve. You can't earn it. You can't work for it. Those of you that have recently been saved, those of you that are here have been saved for a long time, you all recognize this one vital truth that the fact that I'm saved, it didn't come by anything I did. It's not because I could check off a box that I attended church 500 times or I gave so much money in the offering plate. No, no. Salvation is not by what you do, it's not by your works, it's not by anything of yourself, it is all of God. Amen. And that grace that is bestowed upon you is a grace given by God, but that grace is to flow through your life. But can I remind you of something of this grace? This grace has a great cost. When you think about your salvation... It may not have cost you anything, but it cost God, his dear son, on the cross of Calvary. What a cost. What a price to be paid for you and I who are sinners. Notice here that grace I see in verse number 7, it commenced at salvation. Because Paul here, he's not writing to the whole world. He's writing to us who are believers. Every one of us 
is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Now, you look at verses 1 through 6, there is a sense here of uh, this one body. But the word but is used in verse number 7, and it makes a transition here. So Paul now is moving from that uh, uh, grand scheme of things, and he's now coming to the individual, specific, every one of you, that is, believers. Grace commenced at salvation. But now notice verse 8, grace has this conquering aspect. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now this verse, verse number 8, sometimes we read through and we go, "Ah, I'm not sure I understand that. Well, this is quoted in verse uh, 18 of Psalm 68. There are many New Testament verses that you'll find that have been quoted from the Old Testament. Here's what Psalm 68, 18 says. Thou hast ascended on high, thou hast led captivity captive, thou hast received gifts for men, yea, for the rebellious also, that the Lord might dwell among them. Now, two things that need to be understood when you look at an Old Old Testament passage that is quoted in the New Testament. First of all, here's the first question. What's the context? Second question that must be asked is, why is this being quoted? So let's, ask, let's answer the first question. What is the context? Well, the Psalm 68 was a victory song that was written by David after a particular battle. Now, we're not sure which battle. We're not sure who it was over. But we can be certain that there was a victory that David had. And in writing this victory song, it helps us to see the attitude and the actions of a victor. After a king would win a victory, you know what he would do? He would bring the spoils. That is, all the goods that he would get from the enemy that he conquered, he would bring all these things and give them to the people of his nation. But not only would he bring the spoils, but he would also present his soldiers before everybody. Some of these soldiers might have been captured in the war. Some of these soldiers had uh, maybe lost a limb or, or had been severely wounded, but that king would bring in a victorious way all of those soldiers and would say, here are the people that I have brought forth. And the nation would rejoice in the great victory. Now, second question needs to be answered. Why is Paul quoting Psalm 68 verse 18? Well, the very simple answer is, it is being applied to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we know this, that when Jesus descended, the Bible says in John chapter 3, he descended from heaven and he came to this earth. Just recently, we celebrated Christmas, the coming of the Lord Jesus, that first coming to earth as a baby to be born and and raised and to die on the cross of Calvary. But I think there's a little more in this chapter, in this verse, than just the mere descending from heaven to this earth. Because notice what verse number 8 and 9 talks about. Actually, verse 9, he that ascended, what is it? But that he also descended first into the, notice the next phrase, the lower parts of the earth. Now, I cannot dwell here long. But I'm going to throw out a few passages to you, and I'm going to give a quick summary. Here's the passages. You might want to write them down. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 and 19. Luke chapter 23, verse 43. Luke chapter 16, especially verses 22 through 26. What are these passages talking about? Well, in 1 Peter chapter 3, the Bible tells us that Jesus here in verse 19 went and preached unto the spirits in prison. Now, when Jesus went and preached, he didn't preach and just say, okay, now I'm going to have an invitation. Now, there's no second chance salvation. Can I get this clear here today? I have this question asked many, many times. Preacher, when I die, I think there'll be a a, a second chance for me. When I see the glories of heaven and when I see God and when I see Jesus, then I'll turn to him, my friend. It's too late. The time for salvation is now while you live on this earth. So when Jesus here at that 
crucifixion and burial, when he and his spirit went and preached unto those spirits, he wasn't calling for an invitation. The word preach is this idea of announcing. He was announcing to the spirits, I'm about ready to rise. And I'm going to show myself victorious over Satan and sin and death. And he's proclaiming great victory. Luke chapter 23 talks about how Jesus said to the thief on the cross, this day shalt thou be with me in paradise. But Luke 16 is an important passage because two people die and go to a place here. And I want you to catch this. There is a rich man. And there's a man who's named Lazarus. The Bible says that the rich man died and went to hell. That is, in hell, he lifted up his eyes and he felt the torment. Lazarus was a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, and it said that he went into this place called Abraham's bosom. Now, again, this afternoon, you need to read through Luke chapter 16 and see something because there seems to be that these two places where those who believed in Jesus and those who did not believe in Jesus were somewhat in close proximity, but there was a gulf between them. There was no crossing between the two. And I believe here that uh, when Jesus, when he died and his body lay in the grave for those couple of days and his spirit went and preached, I believe that all those that were believers in Jesus, God brought with him. And now those that are dead in Jesus Christ, the Bible says, where are they? They're with Jesus. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So what am I trying to get at in all this? You say, preacher, you've confused me the last five minutes. I'm confused. And so now I'm going to unconfuse it by this simple statement. Your salvation cost you a tremendous price. Jesus died, was buried, And he rose again, and however you may interpret these verses, you may not interpret them the same way that I do, but I want you to understand something. God did something tremendous for your salvation. And your salvation cost you. And what is it about this salvation? Well, it's the completing of it, verse number 7. It's the grace that commenced at salvation. It's the grace that is conquering. But notice it is the grace that is completing. Look at verse 7. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure. Look at verse number 10 at the last phrase that he might fill all things. What has God done for you? God has said, look, all the spoils are mine. I am gifting you as a born-again child of God now. I'm measuring out the things for you that you need. I'm filling all things. Sometimes people say to themselves, Preacher, I I don't know that I can serve God. I don't know that I can tell people about Jesus. I don't know that I can do this particular ministry. Can I say that if God has called you, he's gifted you? He's measured what you need. He's filled all things so you can do what you need to do. But now we come to the latter part of the message, and that is verses 11 through 12, the charge of that ministry. There's the calling, there's the cost, but now the charge, verses 11 through 12. First of all, verse 11, the administration. Notice this. There are four gifted leaders that are mentioned, apostles, prophets, evangelists, and then pastor-teacher is something that I believe is linked together. Now, first of all, the first two offices here are services that I believe are offices that have ended when the New Testament was completed. The office of the apostle, the office of a prophet. Now, the office of apostle here is, in a general sense, it can refer to somebody who is sent And you could say, well, you know, I'm sent as an apostle, yes. But as far as a particular office in the church, we don't have these anymore. You see, there were 12 main apostles that the Lord called. They were people that had to have seen the Lord. 
They had to have witnessed his resurrection. And so these apostles, I believe, when these apostles ended, it ended this office in the era of the local church. But then the prophet, who is that? Well, there's a person who would foretell, that is, the, the very word for prophet has this idea of, of, uh, of, of illuminating something that is, uh, that is of a message, uh, 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 of something that shines to, to, to show forth something. So they would foretell, but also they would foretell. And so here's a prophet in the New Testament, we mainly saw the apostles. In the Old Testament, we mainly saw the prophets. And I believe, according to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20, that these offices here of apostles and prophets are now ended because they were the foundation. What does Ephesians 2, 20 say? And are built upon, that is the church, the body of Christ, is built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Now, I'm not much of a builder, but I understand this. A foundation is an initial part of a building. But Brother Mark, help me understand something. Once the foundation is complete, there's really no more add to add to that foundation other than the structure. The foundation, once it's done, it's done. That's what the apostles and the prophets were with the foundation. John MacArthur wrote this. He said, some have observed that the apostles were like delegates to a constitutional convention. When the convention is over, the position ceases. When the New Testament was completed, the office of the apostle ceased. So that's apostles and prophets. But now notice here, there's two offices that are still in play today. That is the office of evangelist. Now, who's the evangelist? Well, we could very simply say somebody who proclaims the good news. You could say today, you're an evangelist if you tell people about Jesus Christ. But as a particular office, if you will, in the church, this is a special gifted individual. It could be an itinerant evangelist. It could be a church planter. It could be a foreign missionary. But here's a man who is specifically called to give the gospel. But notice your pastor and teacher. Now, we're not talking about two different offices, but it is a combined role. If you read through verse number 12, the word some is used before apostles, it's used before prophets, it's used before uh, evangelists, but it's not used between pastor and teacher. Why is that? Well, that man that fulfills that office as a pastor, he is to lead. The word pastor means to shepherd, to guide, to lead. But as a teacher, he is to feed. Oh, this particular individual of which I happen to be one needs the heart of a pastor and the mind of a teacher. Why are you supposed to pray for your pastors? Because this is what we need. But notice what these offices are given for. What is the administration? Look at this. It is, in verse number 12, the perfecting of the saints perfecting. The word perfecting comes from a particular word from which we get our English word artisan. A person who will work with their hands to accomplish something, to make something, to bring forth something that is good. It's very interesting when Jesus would began calling his disciples he came upon two who were fishermen, and the Bible says in Mark 1.19 that those two men were there, and they were mending their nets. You realize the word mending is the same Greek word of what we have here related to this word here. Those men were putting their net back together with their hands so that way they could get back out there and catch fish. You know what the job of a preacher is? My job is here is to preach and teach and motivate and encourage that you might be able to go out and do the work. 
Notice the administration, that's the accomplishment here. What is it that I'm to make you ready for? Well, it's what it's accomplished and what's the thrust of this message. Pastors and teachers and evangelists are given for the perfecting of the saints. And read the middle phrase with me, for the work of the ministry. Would you say that with me again? For the work of the ministry. Say it one more time. For the work of the ministry. Pastors, teachers, and evangelists have the office to do the teaching and preaching and motivating that all of us together would be ministers, workers. Some of you may be here today and have this notion, Pastor, I I thought we just pay you so you do the work of the ministry. Oh, no, no, no. No, you pay me to preach and to teach and to motivate so all of us together can do the ministry. You know, we've gotten caught in the last several hundred years in the general circles of of Christianity that there is this thing called clergy. That is, those that are set apart, they're paid for the ministry. And then there's the laity. They just kind of come in, sit like a bump on a log, kind of yawn during the sermon, kind of close their eyes, and then walk out and never think any more about anything. I'm telling you what, we have been conditioned that way. You see, I may be paid by the church and thank you for what you do to provide for me and my family, but I want to tell you something. All of us are ministers, whether we're paid or whether we're just, we have another job. I'm looking out here today and I see people that are working full time. You got a full time job. Some of you, it's eight to five. Some of you, it's your own, your own business. And so it's 24 seven. But do you realize whatever it is that you do, your primary calling is to serve the Lord, to serve the Lord. I mentioned at the very beginning of the sermon that all of us have a purpose. In fact, born again, Christians should know their purpose to serve the Lord. The United States Navy has over 700 ships that comprise, and brother, you might know this name here, They comprise something that is called the Mothball Navy. These vessels that are anchored in various harbors around our country will receive regular maintenance on them to prevent rust. But these ships are just sitting there doing nothing, even though they require a lot of money and effort to maintain them. If you go across our country and you find churches that are working churches very similar to this one, and you ask a pastor about the ministry, he'll often say that in his church, there'll be a lot of mothball Christians. That is, there are Christians that kind of come into the harbor, into their pew, sit down, the pastor comes and tries to get the rust off of them, but then they kind of go out of harbor and they're doing nothing. They require a lot of maintenance, but they're not doing anything to serve the Lord. Some of you that have been around Christianity understand this little rule that often pastors have used. It's the 80-20 rule, and that is that 20% of the Christians are doing 80% of the work. But this should not be. Can I say to you, if Christ saved you and called you, He's called you out of this world. He's called you to a local church. And that calling has cost something. But my friend, he's looking for a return on his investment. He's looking for you to serve. You say today, preacher, I I can't serve like I I did when I was younger. My knees hurt. Can barely walk. Got all these problems. You know what? Your mission may change a little bit. You may become more of a prayer warrior. You may become like the dear lady that I heard that was a shut-in and she missed getting out regularly, knocking on doors and sharing Christ with people, but she started making phone calls through the phone book. Yes, young people, there was something in in previous times called a phone book. 
But she'd go through and get one name and call and say, uh, I want to call you and share with you something great. And she began sharing the gospel. And this dear lady led many people to Christ. Beautiful. Your mission may change because your health is deteriorating. But I'm telling you, while God gives you breath, serve him. Do what he's called you to do. Get moving forward. Because there's coming a day when the Lord will return. And I want to be able to hear those words, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. I want to hear those words. And as a pastor, I'm desirous not to just hear it for myself, but I want to be in your presence and hear the Lord look at you and say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Father, thank you for this wonderful day. I don't know that I adequately did anything for this text as a vessel, but Lord, I, I so desire to communicate your word and to encourage people to live for you. I ask right now that as we contemplate on what we've heard, help us, Lord, to act upon it and to follow you. Right now, while heads are bowed, eyes are closed here today, I want to ask this very simple question. I, I, I'm, I mainly in this message talk to believers. But you're here today and you say, Preacher, I'm not a believer. I've never trusted Jesus as my Savior. I don't know what it means to go to heaven. I, in fact, I, if you asked me if I was going to heaven when I die, I don't, I don't know that I'd go. I'm not really sure. Well, can I say to you, you can know for sure before you leave this auditorium. You can have this matter settled. You say, how so? Well, first of all, you've got to admit who you are before God. You're a sinner. You've got to admit that your sin carries with it a penalty. It is separation from God forever. But here's the beauty. God loves you. He sent his dear son, the great cost. Jesus died on the cross, was buried, rose again so you could be saved. And all it takes is by you in a simple faith to say, Oh, God, save me from my sin. Forgive me and become my personal Savior. If you'd like to pray that prayer here today, I'd like to lead you publicly. I'm going to go ahead and pray this prayer in just simple phrases out loud. And if you'd like to be saved today, I'd like to invite you to pray this prayer to yourself, but mean it before God. Please understand the words don't save you per se. It has to be something that you express with your lips, but you believe in your heart. Here's the prayer. As I pray it out loud and you want to be saved today, why don't you pray and ask the Lord to save you? Dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. And I know I cannot save myself. But I believe that Jesus died for me and shed his blood on the cross to wash my sins away. Right now, I'm asking Jesus Christ, God's holy son, to forgive me of all my sins and become my personal savior. Now, while heads are bowed, eyes are closed here today, how many would say, Preacher, I'm not ashamed of it, but I just right now prayed and asked the Lord to be my Savior. Would you just lift your hand up for just a moment? Anyone here today? Preacher, I just prayed that prayer, and I'm not ashamed of knowing Jesus as my Savior. I trust here today every person knows Christ. Can I talk to you as believers now? Those of you that are saved, Have you joined this local church? You've been attending for some time. What are you waiting for? Can I encourage you? Today's the day to do it. Today's the day for you to go ahead and say, I want to begin the process. It might be you need to go through the classes. It might be that you have gone through the classes, but you need to step forward and just make it known. Could I encourage you no greater day than on Vision Sunday to come forward and say, I'd I'd like to be a part of this church. I believe what this church is doing. This church is getting the gospel out. This church loves people. And so I encourage you, when we begin singing, the piano plays, step forward, come right down. We'll have some workers right up front 
Let them know I'd like to join Calvary Baptist Church. Maybe you're here today and you say, Preacher, I, I joined, but boy, I, I'm not doing a whole lot. Or maybe you haven't joined yet, but you'd like to do something. Could I encourage you, come right up here and just say, Lord, I don't know what you have for me. I don't know what, what service you want me to be a part of, but I am willing. I'd love to see a whole group of people come and say, Lord, I'm willing. I'm yours. Use me. Use me. How many are here today and say, Preacher, I want to be used by God. I'm giving myself afresh and anew to God. I want to be used by Him. This 2023, I want to serve God. By uplifted hand, would you just put your hand up right now? God bless you. Would you come forward today and just either kneel at the altar, stand right up in front, come right in the front row, and just pray before God. Say, oh God, here am I. Send me. Why don't you stand to your feet, please, if you would. I'm going to encourage you just to keep your heads bowed, eyes are closed, just for the solemnness of this moment as we do business with God. I'm going to pray, and when I say amen, the piano will begin playing. We'll have a number of our workers will be up here, and I want to encourage you, if you need to join Calvary Baptist Church, you come. If you just raise your hand right now and say, Preacher, I, I want to serve. I want to get busy for God this year. Why don't you come? Father, thank you for this time. I pray that you'd work mightily in our midst. In Jesus' name, amen. Pando's playing.